Hi guys and welcome back. And today we'll start a new project, an unexpected journey for sure, and that's sculpting a 135th scale um, World War I British infantryman. And this really was an accidental project. Whilst I was waiting for paint to dry on the Kessel Itadio base, I just started playing around with a couple of little bits of feet from a Tamiya figure and then started to think, well, maybe I could make something out of this and turn it into a figure. So this is a, a disclaimer right from the start. I am not an expert. I am not a sculptor. This is not a how-to tutorial. It's simply just me documenting the journey, the unexpected journey of sculpting and really loved every moment of it. And I am pretty happy with the final figure. It's, uh, as I recalled the intro for this, it's virtually finished and I'm just doing some painting now and uh, really looking forward to sharing it with you in this video. So once again, not a tutorial, um, but I hope you enjoy watching as things unfold. And before we start looking at the footage, I just want to apologize because the lighting quality is not fantastic. It literally was a spontaneous beginning and I did a lot of it in a fairly compressed period of time and didn't look at the footage until I started to do the editing. So there were some lighting issues and background issues. So I really do apologize. I've got some thoughts on how they can be tidied up for the future filming of these. It's hard to get in close to show what's going on and sculpt at the same time. So just sort of learning how best to approach that. So the quality will improve. Bear with me. I, uh, I promise it will get better. So I had these US infantry legs left over from making the figures for the Castle Litter Dio and um, was just sort of looking at them thinking I wonder you know can I do anything with those. I didn't like the bend of the legs I couldn't see any logical use for them and I thought well I wouldn't mind having a go at making a figure and maybe if I use the boots that will help give me a scale reference point and that's about as much thought as I put into it. So as you saw just before with the Dremel I uh, took off all the bits and bobs off the boots and thought well if I'm going to get scale for the feet I probably need scale for the hands and I don't think I'm going to be good enough to sculpt hands first up. And that'll at least give me an idea about the length of the arms and the width of the arms or the circumference of the arms leading into the wrist. So just sort of my thinking was, well, that'll, that'll help give me scale. And then it was a matter of getting them ready for an armature and putting it all together. So as you can see, and look, again, I apologize. The quality is not fantastic. It really was unintended. The only thing I did have is got quite a good supply of uh, hornet heads. And this one looked like he uh, needed to fit into this diorama that just like the expression on his face. So it was just about preparing the sort of the ends and that gave me a base with the feet for scale and dimensions, the hands on the end of the arms, and, and of course the head. So it sort of gave me the boundaries of what uh, the size of the figure should look like. Okay, come on, all right now. All right now, you boys, come on, sit it down. Okay, what you got in your hands on? Like you look at this, mate. Look at the way I warned you there, okay? Marcus. Michael. 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 Look down, Marcus. Stop breaking that allied tank. Yes, I know it's inferior, but let me tell you then your son. Don't break it. Tell him all. Put that bloody chunk it away. Unless you've got something for everyone, don't do it all. Rick. Rick, is that a smoke? Put your, your pocket smoking, son. Put that out. I don't care if it's not a real cigarette. Doesn't matter. Good God, Karen. What are you doing with that bloody hockey stick? Watch it, son. You take someone's eye out. Right, everyone here. Who's Mottram? Mottram? Mottram. Steve Mottram. Good God, is he doing it again? All right, pay attention. This is very complex. So how do you work out scale? And again, I'm absolutely no expert, but um, if we have a think about it, 35th scale means there's 35 of whatever it is to make up the full-sized real thing. So in a man, if we took, say, an average height of 5 foot 10 inches, and I multiply that out to get inches, so that's 70 inches, and then I have to go on to Google to convert inches to centimetres, and it turns out 177.8 centimetres, which is 1,778 millimetres. Now, if you divide that by 35, so 35 of these things go into 1778, you come out with 50.8 millimetres. Now, just bear that in mind when you have a look at the Tamiya or the Master Box figures or whatever that you're working on right now, they're probably going to be pretty close to that 50.8. Now, if we took the other end of the spectrum at 6'4", which is how tall I am, 
that's 76 inches, so 193.04 centimetres, which is 1930 millimetres. And again, so what fits into that 35 times? And that's going to be uh, quite a bit bigger than the uh, 5 foot 10 figure, 55.1 millimetres. So that's how I work it out. I'm happy to be corrected by the audience. Uh, if you know a better way, you can stop and uh, pause and have a look at that. Uh, some a spread of average heights and what that looks like comparatively against each other. Not all figures are the same height, not all people are the same height, and I think one of the things that I find a little frustrating with the boxed kits is that everyone is the same height and they're all slender. And I know they're all fit young men, but I think there would have been skinnier people and taller people and fatter people and shorter people, so that's part of the attraction of being able to sculpt my own figures. So as you can see, there's just the pieces all laid out and very roughly drew up on my cutting board the scale. The wire for the armature is probably a little bit too thick. I've gone out and bought some thinner stuff now, which is a little bit more flexible. Then I just started to sort of join it all together using a two-part epoxy putty. I've got onto this stuff called Aves, um, which I find really really easy to work with very easy to um, put together so i prefer it from a working perspective to green stuff but what you'll see further on um, when it comes to getting the detail really crisp i don't think it holds the detail as well as green stuff so i think in the next attempt i'll do the aves for the armature and the sub sort of structure so the the body and the skeleton and the muscle definition and things like that um, but when it comes to putting the actual uniforms clothing on, I think I'll try that with the green stuff and see what sort of... So it's just a, you know, a matter of experimenting along the way and seeing what works and probably needed to solder the legs to the, to the torso, but uh, again, completely ill-prepared and unplanned. Uh, and this worked all right, and it was quite a solid little figure all the way through. So um, once it had dried, and I threw a little bit of uh, super glue in there as well, uh, it was it was pretty robust. And at this stage, yeah, just taking shape with the vaguest of ideas of what I was looking for, which was a guy sort of slightly leaning back against the trench wall, one hand in his pocket and the other hand holding a, a bottle or a cup or a flask or a food tin or something like that. So. Uh, that was about as clear as it was in my mind. So a day later, and the armature pretty solid, just started to put on, the, I guess, the extremities, so the boots, and get a feel for where the hands were, and, and start the initial uh, posing of the figure. So I wanted it leaning back a little bit. I wanted the right foot reasonably flat on the ground, the left leg slightly bent, almost like the heels resting up against the back. And it was all done by gut and eye at this stage. A very slow process, just sort of thinking my way through it and doing lots of checking against other commercial figures to make sure it was still like, it wasn't too wide or it wasn't too tall. And uh, at this point in time, it was all looking pretty much in line with what you'd get out of a box uh, in size and shape. So Just played around a little bit with the head, so the head really dictates the ultimate height, and the neck on the on the Hornet figures is always pretty long as well. And I deliberately left the armature a bit long because I didn't I didn't. You can always take a little bit more off, but it's hard to put it back on. So there was a lot of sort of mucking around, and sorry, going out of camera shot a little bit as well because my eyes aren't all that fabulous so sometimes i have to get it a bit closer to my head to see what's going on but uh, again a little bit of trial and error uh, a little bit of a crack in the back of the uh, epoxy putty there which uh, just whacked some super glue in that along the way so it was pretty robust and yeah again lots of eyeballing of the figure and does that look normal and that didn't look normal it looked way too tall and a little bit of measuring and and what have you and just fumbling around by and large until i got it vaguely uh, in in the shape that i thought looked okay And 
and that's sort of the vague vision for having having the figure leaning up against uh, a trench wall, having his cup or having a, a drink out of his tin or something like that. So then it was really a matter of just building up the skeleton and, um, and the muscle tone and what, what have you, and I, I think that's officially called skinning, but I might not be right there. So not very exciting, bit of music, and just watch as the, uh, as the figure takes shape. And what I've found in playing around with this is just getting the basic form down is most important. Initially, I often tried to sculpt in detail right from the get-go, but this has really been done in three layers of just bulking it out and then starting to develop the, the human form on top of that and letting that dry out and then going to put the clothing on. And it takes a lot of pressure off because you don't have to get it right first time. And as it builds up, it gives you a little bit more substance and some natural form sort of evolves, which seems to make it easier as well. So. Uh, yeah, don't try and do it all in one big bang. It's a thing that needs patience and, and gradual build up. So at this point, it just started to build up some of the details. So his left hand is disappearing into the pocket of his trousers. And uh, again, just started to work on the, the broad shape. And uh, the poxy putty is interesting because it's it's very soft. So that that's a plus in as much as it makes it very easy to get into place and move it around um, with the different sculpting tools and that silicon tool has been a godsend it's uh, new in my arsenal and uh, I don't think you could do it without something like that uh, I've got two ones a, a sharper edge as well And then because I don't know what I'm doing, I probably over-engineer everything, so I sort of tried to mark his fingers in to give that more definite shape coming through the pocket, but then the piece that I put over was probably too thick and captured some of it and you did the turn back for the pocket edge and things like that. And look, you really, I mean, it's, it's such a personal preference thing and it's quite, well, it's quite liberating to a degree because you can do whatever you like and you know if you don't particularly like what you've done well you can just scrape it off and start again which i had to do a couple of times but there's a great satisfaction from creating it yourself and and i think i found a great freedom in not looking at a an, a commercial figure and saying oh, what, what am i going to take away here and where am i going to cut it and how am i going to rejoin that and will that look natural and i don't really like that pocket but i can't file that down because i'll file it in detail somewhere else and so that element of it is quite good 
and and look for the history buffs who watch this figure evolve and will probably be you know gasping in horror going well hang on a minute they didn't have leggings like that or they wouldn't have worn that tunic with uh, with those pants you're no doubt 100 percent correct so i looked at a lot of reference materials and and came to the conclusion that you pretty much got away with wearing whatever you liked in the trenches um after a period of time so i don't think guys were particularly spick and span that would have been a pretty horrendous uh, existence so uh, it's all uh, it's all a work of art um you know lots of artistic license uh, in what he's wearing and, and how it looks just putting on a little bit of water uh, which i find helps just smooth things down um really well but it's only got to be just a little bit if you if you drown it in water then it'll uh, everything starts to go a bit opaque and it then then can get quite hard to work with uh, so you just got to be really careful and and also in putting in details so starting to try and put some um, st- stretching in the fabric and what have you find that has to be very subtle well let me qualify that. I find it had to be very subtle because it looked quite horrendous while it was um, still supple. But when it dried, it was uh, it was actually more subtle than I thought. So uh, I've got places where there's quite good texture in the clothing, and I've got some other spots where there's there's not very good texture at all. So again, trial and error, and uh, you know, weathering hides a multitude of sins, and a bit of mud in the right places uh, won't won't go astray.
so just mucking around now getting the uh, undershirt on and trying to get the details around the collar so a little picture that uh, popped up before in fact we might put that back up again now they came in uh, seemingly it's hard to know the precise colors but they generally seem to be gray although there were some with some bluey tones in them as well and again i guess age and fading and dirt and wear and tear they could be any color so some sort of gray color but i just wanted to get the it's a collarless neck sort of a, a v neck in the middle so just again building it up slowly getting the shapes as right as possible and just as i said the, the, one of the things that's really good about this aves stuff which I, I think is better than the green stuff so it's good for building it up but i still think the green stuff might be better for the final details of clothing is that uh, it's so easy to blend it in you can just keep adding it in and it, uh, it works really well So in building up the clothes, and there's no great signs to it, I uh, have been using this technique, which is just to roll out a piece of the putty as thin as possible, and then just use that as the, to get the bulk of the, the clothing item in place. And again, I'm not sure if there's a right or wrong way, but at least this way you don't spend a lot of time sort of trying to spread a lump all over the place. And it gives you a bit of an immediate visual feel for is it the right length and is it looking like the right shape. So. Again, I'm optimistic that uh, my technique will improve over time. Again, it got a reasonably um, good end result. In fact, when you see the painted figure at the end, and it's still not finished as I record this audio, I think I got the texture on the back probably better than anywhere else. Not on the undershirt, but on the on the coat that came over the top of it. So this is the beginning of the of the sleeveless sort of leather and wool jerkin, I guess it's called. So yeah, very happy with the texture on the back of this uh, in the finished product. So having just brought up the broad form then started to look at the edges and again in my mind this is a compilation of different pictures I've seen but I don't think I've necessarily seen one exactly like this. It's a, it's a rusty sort of coloured leather jerkin with a sheepskin lining and sheepskin edging around the coat and around the sleeves. That's how it's coming out in my mind anyway so just have some thin strips rolled out and then worked into the base material so it all looks like it's together in one piece. I think having the broader surface of the back of the jacket gave me more scope for the texture. And then just used a pin stuck into a little 3x3 three three piece of balsa wood to try and get some texture into the what should be representing the wool parts, which I think looks alright once it's painted up. I, I think I actually needed something finer than a pin, and I'm not sure what that is, so I'll have to go searching, but uh, it's not too bad. And then it was just a case of getting on with the right arm and filling up the armature, putting your skin on it, and then working my way through to build up the, the muscle tone and then the clothing. So I'll leave you in peace. We're nearly at the finish now, so not very long to go. Stick with it. it hopefully it will be worth seeing the end product.
lucky last was just um, gluing on a helmet, which I found a British helmet in my little spares box, and it seemed to fit quite well. Put a little bit of the putty on his head first, so it had something to adhere to, and so it forced some out to give a hairline, and then just poked around at that with my little needle tool, and uh, accidentally created a moustache. A bit came off his forehead that looked very moustache-like, and I thought, well, why not? And uh, really happy with that, so a happy accident that looks pretty good. And that's it, we'll come back with some photos of it finished and um, in three stages. So finished as a sculpture, finished with the undercoat on and then finished as the final painted and weathered figure. So thanks guys, I'll be back to say goodbye.
And that's it. Really enjoyed doing this. As I said, it all started a bit spontaneously, but gathered momentum and and look, I never expected it to come out anywhere near as well as it has. I thought it would just be a learning exercise and, and probably would end up scrapped or you know, maybe as a casualty somewhere in a diorama in the future. So really pleased it came up the way it did. Uh, there'll be six figures in this diorama and I'll, I'll be sculpting all of them uh, with the exception of their heads and, uh, and their hands. I don't think I'm up to that yet. And it'll be a trench scene, World War I, uh, of course. So um, that'll run in parallel with finishing the uh, Castle Itter M Group build and starting the next M Group build, which is the Gulf War build, and I've got all the bits and, and bobs ready for that now. So thanks again so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it, and uh, really looking forward to comments and uh, seeing what you think. So take care, everyone. Bye.